Hello everyone. Welcome to another International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Last week, we began a review of 2021 global situation. Today, we continue it in a second part. Some of the other major developments in 2021 and what the future holds for them. Last week, we talked about the pandemic, the insurrection on Capitol Hill, the Biden presidency, Chinese developments, Indo-Pacific, Quad and AUKUS, and Afghanistan. Today, we'll talk about a few other things, depending on the time. India-Russia relations, Ukraine, Russia-NATO complexities, German change of government, and um, climate change, and also Ethiopia and Sudan, not to forget the African continent. But since all of you are avid readers of the Hindu at the IAS Academy, hope you have seen my op-ed in the Hindu entitled From Selective to Universal Engagement, identifying some of the issues on which our external affairs minister was particularly involved. The point I have made is that the situation in the world compelled us to be hyperactive in diplomacy. And therefore, we found uh, the external affairs minister particularly, and also prime minister and others, were very active in various fora. Not necessarily all friendly to us, but even those which were not so friendly. So that's the thesis I have, I have put forward. And generally, it has been received well by the strategic community. So that is the same theme that I have been mentioning to you, that uh, we have been very active, but solutions have not been found for some of the crucial things like Ladakh and Afghanistan. But there are other uh, developments which may not directly involve us, but may have some bearing on India's future and India itself exerting some influence on that. And the first is the India-Russia relations. It was under some strain in the early 2021. Afghanistan was one of the reasons, but also Russia had some, shown some inclination to improve relations with uh, Pakistan. And our joining the Quad and supporting AUKUS, etc., had created some concern in Russia. And so some kind of some wrinkles had appeared in the relationship. And it was good that uh, President Putin made his uh, second visit after the beginning of the visit abroad, after the beginning of the pandemic to come to India and uh, dealt with some of these issues. Of course, the difference about Indo-Pacific remains and also our closing, close relationship with the United States is causing concern in Russia because the United States-Russia relationship aspect of the visit was the tenure of defense cooperation. Because in that we are particularly dependent on Russia because of our traditional linkage with the Soviet Union. And uh, whenever India has diversified arms purchases, etc., there have been tension in India-Russia relations. So that has been set aside by the import of S-400 um, in the face of U.S. opposition and also AK-103 um, rifles and the beginning of the 2 plus 2 dialogue. That is the first time United States, Russia and India engaged in defense minister, foreign minister, two plus two dialogue for the first time. It has been agreed that we'll have another one uh, next year in Moscow. So the bilateral relations had lost some warmth in early 91 to early 2021. And the purpose was that, and in that it was a very good visit uh, because though Russia is not supporting India vis-a-vis -vis China, they were not uh, too explicit about that. And they 
heard from our defense minister the need for india russia cooperation in the context of the situation in on the china border also and uh, there are other because of the defense cooperation uh, the uh, concerns they had that india was uh, veering towards um united states has been considerably softened and um, in all the statements made by both sides the the continuity of relationship with russia was emphasized and uh, the agreement signed some uh, several agreements apart from the military ak203 rifles and so on but also 28 agreements on our various issues Uh, commerce technology cyber very many other things so because we you know that um, uh, russia is the only one operating a nuclear plant in uh, in india the only foreign nuclear plant we have in uh, india so there are several uh, reasons why india russian relations should improve and there will also this chennai vladivostok corridor uh, for greater access to Uh, the eastern part of uh, of russia so on the whole it was a successful visit very practical and it removed several cobwebs in the understanding between uh, the two countries on what we call indo pacific and what they call asia pacific etc so things are moving both sides seem to be happy about the visit and that has softened the international situation a little bit uh, but of course concerns remain about um, russian interest in afghanistan our concerns with china etc and also of course pakistan in the middle of all that uh, but on afghanistan itself the differences between the two countries were narrowed a little bit uh, because we identified the common positions in the two countries that is an inclusive government no terrorism no violation of human rights so and this kind of things that we are concerned with because russia had uh, vetoed the resolution of the security council but most elements of the security council were a resolution were kind of reiterated in a bilateral context and on the whole it was a balancing act but very much a useful one and um, then of course the ukraine crisis also we have dealt with in detail um but uh, the tension seems to be rising uh, between russia and ukraine and the united states is very closely watching they had some conversations and in geneva there is going to be a us russia meet on this particular issue it is fairly simple in the sense that the russian demand is not too much basically what they are saying that the old understanding that the former uh, soviet republics will not be made members of nato so that has been violated already because uh, in the baltic states and the balkans some of these small countries have joined nato or on the pro- in the process of doing that so that original understanding has been compromised uh, but that may be a little bit away from the main area of concern and therefore uh, us accepted i mean russia accepted it but when it comes to ukraine particularly after they had um, you know succeeded in taking crimea away and since they have a lot of interest internally in ukraine there are many supporters of russia inside ukraine so they have serious concern about ukraine becoming a member of nato and um, it looks that that will be the compromise that uh, they will not activate it as at this point and that this crisis will be avoided because at this time of corona virus again hitting europe in a very hard way uh, nobody wants to have a war so neither ukraine nor united states will want a war because russia is very careful in giving the signals that this is their bottom line so as long as that bottom line is respected um, i don't expect a, a, a crisis in uh, 
in Russia, you know, Ukraine relationship. And some adjustments, arrangements, it may not be ironclad guarantees, but uh, some understanding that uh, uh, Ukraine will not uh, enter the enter NATO in a hurry. I think that must uh, soften the situation. But it's more important for US and Russia to talk about other things uh, because um, between China and uh, Russia, US has two uh, countries to uh, cope with. And um, perhaps it may be easier uh, to have some kind of detente or uh, some kind of rapprochement with Russia than with uh, China. China is more complicated. And therefore, that may be the way, the way to go for the US to cool down on the Russia side and then try to see how they can save the China situation. Uh, what India should do, because everybody has agreed that we should keep away from this crisis because uh, we do not want to take sides. And uh, whether it is on principle or on practical matters, it is better that we keep out of this controversy. And that's what we are doing. Because if we have to say anything, I'm sure we'll say that things must be uh, settled peacefully rather than any one side. I don't think we will be interested in uh, doing that. Uh, then government change in Germany, we discussed in detail. Again, there's a, there's a big change. Because after a long period, Angela Merkel's rule has ended and her party is not in the coalition. But in Germany, there are not many sharp differences between these parties because they can have any kind of coalition, sometimes a rainbow coalition where every party joins in a uh, But um, this time, maybe because Angela Merkel has been in the government for many years and uh, some of her cabinet colleagues are already in this government, there will be some continuity, but of course there will be change in style. Uh, the uh, new chancellor uh, will be influenced by the Green Party, which has come to power. Green Party has come to power, not only really come to power, but in an established manner in the government. That will be the major difference. And uh, Green Party's agenda is social justice and climate change. That is their agenda. They have been working with various governments in, uh, uh, in Europe uh, to strengthen this social justice and climate change agenda to put forward. And um, as far as India is concerned, there will also be continuity. Uh, the new government has said that uh, uh, they will look forward to greater cooperation with uh, India. And uh, even in their coalition agreement, they have mentioned India as a, a major partner. And uh, Germany was a little bit uh, enthusiastic, has come somewhat romantic about uh, China in the initial stages. And China tried to, even during uh, Angela Merkel's time, to get a foothold in Germany to move into Europe in a big way after the kind of differences that existed between the European countries and uh, uh, President of the United States, particularly President Trump. But after President Biden came back, uh, that is not a, a big issue anymore. And uh, even more than uh, Angela Merkel, Chancellor Rawls will be uh, friendly to the United States and American interests. Even on migration issue, I think, the, the new German government will be, will be softer and will be as welcoming of uh, migrants as it used to be. Though in the last years of Angela Merkel, there was some uh, criticism that Germany was being too generous and therefore there were some restraints imposed. And so that is uh, good news there. I'm sure European Union will, Germany will uh, assume a bigger position in the European Union because of the um, withdrawal of uh, UK from the European Union. Know, that again we have discussed. And uh, the new relationship between US and UK because of AUKUS 
will give UK more prominence as an independent country rather than as a member of the European Union to deal with these countries. So it is not a complete departure from the Atlantic politics to Pacific. So now with UK's involvement, that linkage has been established. So it's not just a Pacific arrangement, but also the old arrangement, the traditional Atlantic interest in the uh, Indo-Pacific would be revived. And there's a proper military alliance, even though we are not part of it. It may be helpful for us to deal with, uh, uh, with China. Of course, climate change, again, we have discussed in detail what has happened in Glasgow. Uh, initially, it was a kind of disappointment that Glasgow did not achieve very much. Uh, but um, increasingly now, the new assessments that are coming are more encouraging. Uh, because even though, for example, our commitments were all conditional to um, financing being available, uh, I believe that uh, just now, Swaminath and Iyer had an article the other day saying, that we have gone beyond our uh, commitment in the case of fulfilling some requirements of the Paris Agreement. I have to look at this carefully because uh, I don't know which aspect. Basically, reducing our dependence on fossil fuel, some commitment that we have given, we have already over fulfilled. And Swami Nathan Iyer is saying that this is a major event which went unnoticed. So, so otherwise also the moves that we are do, taking in um, energy, the, conven the uh, non-conventional energy, we are very firm, we are moving forward. And um, it is quite possible that even without the financial uh, support that uh, Prime Minister Modi made conditional to our uh, fulfilling our uh, commitments, like 2030 and 2070, etc., will go forward, maybe not to the fullest extent, but will go forward more enthusiastically. So we are not a spoiled sport, as it was as it was projected by the uh, the British president of the um, COP, because he tried to put the whole focus on India and coal. And uh, he was very keen on a phase out rather than a phase down, etc. So he tried to put India in the dock, as it were. And that is why at the end of the COP, uh, the discussions were uh, somewhat uh, confused. But India made a positive contribution by agreeing to facing down coal, in spite of the fact that we have very serious problems if we don't use coal for some more time. So on the whole, even the commitments of the developed countries uh, seem to be serious. But uh, this can be seen only how far and how fast we will be able to deal with the climate question. So there is also good news that some technology is being developed to capture uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And if that happens, it will be a scientific solution rather than uh, a political solution, because political solution is possible, but uh, the basic difference, as I have explained to you several times, is the reluctance of developed countries to change their lifestyle. So unless that happens, you cannot have a political solution for the climate change. Uh, but uh, through scientific innovation and also efforts to replace uh, you know, fossil fuels with uh, non-traditional items like solar energy and others will probably make things better. Although the predictions are, are that 2100 will still be much above the two degrees Celsius desirable limit that has been set. So our, after a couple of months, the achievements of Glasgow appear to be better. But then it depends on the assessment made by the IPCC in the next one year or so, when we will have some more concrete uh, um, evidence of some success. But on India's side, we are pretty serious about our commitments. 
then we are doing everything and if we have fulfilled our requirements of the Paris Agreement, it's even better that our uh, commitment will be uh, much more appreciated. Uh, two things happening in uh, Africa was hardly noticed because of all these other global developments. These are of some concern. Uh, not directly, we are not involved. India is not involved in this. But since we have a long tradition of friendship with Africa in general, because Africa, we must remember, is not one country. We often talk of Africa as a, it's a continent, it's not just one country. If you say India-Africa relations, it will be very difficult to figure it out. Which Africa, which part of Africa. And we have some special relations with East Africa for various reasons. Of course, with Nigeria and others in the West also, we have good relationship. But there are several other countries with which we have really no, um, uh, well, we have contacts, we have diplomatic relations, but nothing substantial. And basically because Africa has been looking at India with some amount of friendship uh, because of our traditions and our contacts and our small little assistance programs we have, etc. But when donors started rushing to Africa, first the Japanese, then the Koreans, and the Chinese, and all that, uh, the focus shifted. Even the uh, kind of assistance we are giving. I spent two years in Kenya. I didn't see much enthusiasm. Of course, India was a great favorite in terms of friendship. Many of the leading people in uh, Kenya were students in India. The ICCR uh, scholarship. And once a year, they used to come to the High Commissioner's residence to express their gratitude, etc. But I didn't see them particularly friendly when I went to them with proposals and so on. There, of course, they drew a line of what is beneficial to them. One um, uh, interesting instance was when we fought the elections for uh, the membership, non-permanent membership of the Security Council against Japan. And uh, even though I had very good relations with the president, and uh, of course he himself was always talking of friendship with India, uh, but he was quite forthright in telling me to my face that he'll not be able to vote for India because Japan has committed a huge amount of money for development purposes to Kenya. He didn't ask me, but he sounded as though, will you be able to pay the kind of money? So, which was not very, uh, very friendly. And so he did not hide his intention to vote for Japan. And of course, we lost very badly in that election. We got only 40 votes. And we should have withdrawn, but uh, several countries had told us they would support, etc. But I must say, Kenya was at least uh, honest about it. And I very, very categorically told the government that uh, we should not expect the Kenyan vote, and we did not get it. So that is their priority. Yes, some scholarships, those who cannot get an American or a British or a Japanese scholarship, he will come to India. And they enjoy it very much when they come to India. Most of them who have come to India have gone back with great uh, um, enthusiasm about India, about Indian food, Indian uh, culture, community, and so on. Some of them, of course, misbehaved in India and had to be sent back because they have suddenly found themselves very prosperous. Because they used to get money from them, their parents as well as from, um, uh, from the government of India and particularly students from Nigeria, etc., were a problem in the, in the universities. But on the whole, the scholarship program was very successful. Then we had extended some credit lines to many African countries, uh, which they have not been using very much, because credit lines mean they, want, they have to use Indian technology and Indian personnel. And also they have to bear the cost, share the cost of experts we send. Idea is not to save money, but to involve them in the development aspects. Uh, there's a new book, book has come out uh, on India-Africa relations, which I'm now reading uh, by Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, which looks at India-Africa relationship 
comprehensively. So let's see what it comes up with. But my own experience in Africa was that we were not of great importance to them, particularly after the Chinese uh, arrival. And the Chinese have replaced the Japanese and the Koreans, etc., in terms of money, because but they Africans realize that the Chinese have an ulterior motive by in the sense that uh, they are looking for the rich wealth, mineral wealth, etc., and also putting them into debt through the Belt and Road Initiative. So the Africans were very enthusiastic with the Chinese initially, but now they are getting disillusioned a little bit. And uh, of course, we cannot match the kind of assistance that China is producing, is providing to the United, to the Africans. Uh, but wherever we can, we do. And we, in the Ministry of External Affairs, have become much more conscious of the importance of Africa. And uh, we are giving much attention to it, I believe. But it was not the case. It was all kind of goody-goody relationship without much substance. But now, I suppose, in the context of the problem that they have with China, we are moving more and more close to, to India. That is in general about Africa. Because in your studies, Africa will figure, and therefore you cannot ignore Africa fully. So you need to follow developments in Africa also in your uh, general studies uh, paper relating to international relations. So at least the crisis points, the leadership, the names of the leaders, etc. Uh, you should remember. And the name which will be remembered a lot last year from 2019 is the Nobel Prize awarded to the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Mr. Abiy Ahmad. Uh, this was a big surprise uh, because nobody had heard much about what he had done to its neighbor Eritrea. They had a very serious conflicts uh, with Eritrea. And since Mr. Abiy Ahmad became uh, Prime Minister in April 2018, he made very sincere peace efforts with Eritrea and came to uh, some agreements with Eritrea. And that is what won him the Nobel Prize for peace. Uh, it was probably because it was Africa, and, uh, somebody who was sincere enough. And people must have been aware of the complications. But the irony is that Mr. Abiy is now fighting a war. And uh, having won a Nobel Prize for peace, which is quite ironic. Because what, he, what happened was his uh, solving problems with Eritrea uh, created uh, problems with uh, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, uh, an area that um, in uh, Tigray or Tigray, where people were, that's the border land of uh, Eritrea. Uh, were against this arrangement and slowly uh, development, a move developed against uh, uh, Mr. Abiy. And um, so when he wanted elections, there was objection. And um, then when he postponed the elections, the TPLF, that the Tigray People's Liberation Front, held elections themselves and uh, accused uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, trying to grab power. So, though it is only 6% of the population, the ethnicity problem in Ethiopia raised its ugly head, and they virtually went into a civil war. And the Prime Minister had announced at that time that I am just leaving the capital Addis Ababa and I'm going to the front to fight, physically fight with the Tigray uh, front. I don't know what happened to him since then, we have not heard much. And the TPLF had also good relations with Sudan, about which we will talk very really briefly. So now what Mr. Abiy has to do is to reach out to the various uh, groups, Ethnicity, different ethnicities, and uh, he is getting support from the United Nations, of course, African Union, and uh, 
and generally all peace-loving people in the world. Uh, but he has got involved in it. This was a now, this was a, a kind of outcome of what he did in terms of territory. So the ethnicity problem still remains as part of Ethiopian politics. So let us hope that this will be resolved without any external intervention, except the intervention of the United Nations and the African Union. As you know, internationally, there is a accepted principle that Africa should be left to resolve its own problems and not intervene in them unnecessarily. And the African Union has a machinery and it has been effective in various areas. But in Africa, generally, it is the tribes that rule, not nations. Because straight lines were drawn on the borders and tribes were left on both sides of the international borders and therefore it created complications in many places. And that is part of the problem with Ethiopia also. And Sudan, of course, is a very confusing uh, uh, picture because we will not go back into history too much. So let us start with the with the Lieutenant Colonel Al-Bashir, who took power in 1989 in a, a military coup. And then in 1993, he appointed himself as uh, uh, president. And then like other dictators, he declared himself a political leader. And uh, he established a one-party government in 1996 after some kind of elections. And uh, then he became a fan of Osama bin Laden, who was invited to come and live in Sudan. Uh, this, of course, caused grave concern in the United States and elsewhere, and the support of and to become a state sponsor of terrorism. It was uh, declared, and uh, it uh, deteriorated into a virtual a war in, uh, in Darfur between the, and the basic issue there was uh, the Arab and non-Arab communities. In 2011, the referendum, South Sudan seceded from Sudan and became an independent country. The latest member of the United Nations. This is a very unusual thing. And um, then in 2021, uh, a sovereign council was appointed with a prime minister, Mr. Abdul, Ab, Abdullah Hamdok. And um, he was carrying on, uh, but there was a, an attempted coup in uh, September 2021. So and then um, uh, uh, a new regime was established by um, Abdul Fattah Arbun Khan, who continued. Uh, even though there was a civilian government, he really uh, controlled everything. And um, so from uh, there is a democratic journey in uh, Sudan since uh, uh, 2019, after the ouster of al-Bashir, but al-Burhan continued uh, to exercise great influence and authority in Sudan. And uh, as recent as uh, day before yesterday, or yesterday, that is the 2nd of um, January 2022, uh, Mr. Hamdok has resigned. So again, throwing the country into uncertainty. So war terrorist uh, government, internal war, secession of uh, Southern Sudan, and continuing military dictatorship, then efforts to have civilian uh, government, and all through Sudan with all the, all the coronavirus and everything else, has been going through a difficult time. Uh, but once again, this is an issue which has to be resolved by the UN as well as the African Union. 
We have good relations with Sudan, just as we have good relations with Ethiopia. Ethiopia, of course, because of the uh, OAU headquarters there, we have closer and uh, larger relationship. Sudan, the UN is very active, and I know of several Indian UN officials who have worked very well in Sudan. So, but um, the recent events were bad. Some 57 persons were killed, and that is why Prime Minister Hamdok has uh, resigned. I'm sure the new year they are engaged in, uh, in, in efforts to bring about a compromise. But uh, looking at the history of Sudan, we cannot expect UN peacekeeping operation is still maintained there, but we are also finding it difficult to continue there. And um, so that may also be a, be a problem, but let's hope that things will be settled in a democratic manner in this African uh, country. So that completes the uh, quick review of uh, 2021. I focused on the crucial issues which are of particular touch to us. And as I um, mentioned in my Hindu article, I said all these uh, developments have kept us busy. And uh, Prime Minister, of course, stayed back, but the External Affairs Minister was very visible. In fact, he traveled despite all the uh, discomforts and the risks involved. And we have made our point of view clear to everyone. But the two most crucial issues, that is uh, Ladakh and Afghanistan, we have not been able to find anything concrete. But the efforts are on, conversations are taking place. So we are not particularly selective about to whom we talk. And uh, that is shown in the recent visit to Myanmar of the Foreign Secretary. Uh, because uh, the whole world, except China, is opposing the military regime in uh, Yangon or in, uh, in uh, Myanmar. And uh, we had, of course, started off several projects in Myanmar. It was particularly helpful when Aung San Suu Kyi was also in the government. Uh, we were not only supporting uh, military, but also the civilian government. But now that the military has given up all pretension, to having a collaboration with the civilians, it must have been very difficult for India to take this decision, to visit the big army chief. And this is like I said, like going into the lion, lion's den and asking it to be vegetarian for a change. And that is what we would have told him. And normally such advice is not taken very, um, very, uh, softly by most countries, because nobody wants to be advised as to what they should do. But we soften the uh, issue or the situation by carrying lots of COVID vaccines and other things which would be helpful to Myanmar. Again, a humanitarian uh, assistance program. But more than that, to show that China is not the only friend that Myanmar has. And that's important because otherwise, China will have a field day in Myanmar. So what, what uh, concrete results will come from it, whether uh, Mr. Shingla has been able to change the heart of the military, we are not so sure. But it was a brave effort on the part of India. And that completes the whole uh, idea of India's universal engagement. And the crowning glory will be if India is able to organize an India-US-China meet. Many people are talking about it. And if that comes about, I think that will be the ultimate in engaging everyone and trying to contribute to world peace, even by keeping aside our major interests. Instead of highlighting that, we are trying to bring about some kind of a, of a peaceful transition to the post-COVID world. So thank you very much. Yes, that's a very valid question. And the point I was making was 
Africa means 54 states. I don't, I don't think as aspirants you will have time to study every, every country in Africa. And um, so even the, the odd chance of uh, one question in international relations from Africa, you cannot afford to spend so much time on all the countries because uh, there is no such unified place as Africa. So what I would suggest is instead of focusing on specific countries like Ethiopia or Sudan, where there is an immediate problem, you deal with and try to read up issues on uh, uh, the general issues in Africa. Of course, the most important issue is development, then uh, tribal issues, border issues, exploitation of Africa by other countries, particularly by China their colonial linkages and their traditional relationships with India. So some kind of a general uh, understanding of Africa uh, may be enough. I'm not saying that Africa is not important because many people feel, believe that the world of the future will depend on where Africa goes. And the epidemic has had taken its soul. We don't know when it will end. South Africa was particularly a sad case because they became, uh, you know, victims because they found us the Omicron virus in South Africa. They only identified it and told the world. And they have done much better than what the Chinese did. But then immediately everybody started ostracizing South Africa, canceling flights and so on. So in the president of South Africa said, what are you doing to us? What are you punishing us for? So this is the misunderstanding that we have whenever South Africa is mentioned. So, so my suggestion is to uh, prepare for some general issues on Africa, uh, which can be used in your uh, main paper particularly. All right. Thank you very much. Once again.